Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to today's webinar, Overview of VA's Caregiver Program for Military Caregiver Month. This webinar is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership, CFBMP, the American Red Cross Military Veterans Caregiver Network, and the VA Caregiver Program and Education and Training Office. My name is True Luster Pauling. I am the Senior Outreach Pro Specialist in CFBMP. I will be your moderator this afternoon. Everyone's phone has been muted. If you have a question during the presentation today, please type it in the Q&A box on the right of your screen. I will read the questions at the end of the presentation and the presenters will provide a response. The presentation will be provided to everyone that registered and joined this webinar today. This is a live recording. I would like to thank Ms. Melissa Como and Ms. Nancy Dukey for this collaboration. We are grateful for your time today. But before we get started, I would like to introduce Mr. Conrad Washington. Mr. Washington serves as the director for the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Mr. Washington retired from the United States Marine Corps with 20 years of active duty service with the combat tour in 2004 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom II. Mr. Washington is a licensed minister actively serving in his faith. He received his bachelor's degree of divinity in pastoral studies from Moody Theological Seminary. He also holds an MA in business management and a bachelor's of science degree in education. Additionally, he is a graduate of VA's class of 2017 Virtual Aspiring Leaders Program. At this time, I give you Mr. Washington for opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And thank all of you for joining us today. I often share how many choices we have after COVID with the virtual platforms. So thank you for stopping by today. We acknowledge this month, Military Caregiver Month, which is the reason why we're having this webinar today. We also acknowledge Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Month. That was a handful, a mouthful, shall I say. We also uh, acknowledge Mental Health Month. Uh, and this particular week is National EMS, em Emergency Medical Services Week. And we're also coming up on Memorial Day, as many of you know, which is observed on the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. This year is this upcoming Monday, May 29th. Memorial Day was originally known as Decoration Day and originated in the years following the Civil War to become an official federal holiday in 1971. Many observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family bar uh, gatherings and participating in parades. And yes, some even have barbecues. <laughs> so however you acknowledge Memorial Day, I hope that you will take a moment and pause and remember those who gave their life for our country. So I also wanna thank Nancy for pre presenting today. She's a VA employee, subject matter expert. We're excited for her to share uh, about this uh, caregiver support program is very important. I wanna thank Melissa for joining us. She's a director uh, for the Military uh, Veteran Caregiver Network at Red Cross. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us and partnering with us. We look forward to future partnerships as well uh, as we talk about overview of VA caregiver program. So thank you very much. Back to you, Truman. Thank you, Mr. Washington. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Melissa Como. Please read her entire bio on the screen. Ms. Como serves as the director of the American Red Cross Military and Veterans Caregiver Network. Her book, Sleeping with the War, was published in 2014 and has brought the family and caregiver's perspective to life after combat. Melissa served as a fellow for the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. She's working with VA Whole Health, Caregiver to Survivor, Hidden Helpers, and the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Melissa was appointed to the Federal Advisory Committee for Veterans, Families, Caregivers, and Survivors at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. She has an MS in Information Technology and Project Management. At this time, I give you Ms. Como for opening remarks. Thank you, 
you so much. Yes, my name is Melissa Como, and I'm so grateful to be with you all today as we celebrate and commemorate uh, Military Caregiver Month. So at the end of my bio, you'll note that I am a caregiver. I am a proud uh, military spouse and caregiver to my husband, who is a combat wounded Marine. And I've been his caregiver now for about 12 years. And I have really benefited from many of the programs you're going to hear about today from um, the VA. In addition to that, it is my pleasure to serve as the director of the Military and Veteran Caregiver Network here at the American Red Cross. And we serve caregivers of all eras, all relationships across all locations with best in practice peer support programming. And we do that in a couple ways. So we have our Hero Care Resource Directory, which has at least 800 resources for every zip code in America. We have our caregiver calendar, which offers uh, caregivers opportunities to engage in events, self care webinars, peer support groups and other types of events that are of interest to them. And then we have our 3 peer based support programs, which include a peer mentor program, an online communicated dedicated completely to the caregiver experience and our most popular program, which is uh, our caregiver peer support groups. And these happen in the community um, at Starbucks at churches. Um, libraries and Red Cross facilities, as well as online, because, as you know, after COVID, a lot of um, programs are more popular now online. So we do offer those programs uh, to all caregivers, as well as to veterans who themselves are in a caregiving role. And again, it's my pleasure to be with you today, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Como, for those opening remarks. We appreciate your time today. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker, subject matter expert for today, Ms. Nancy Dukey. Please read her entire bio on the screen. Ms. Dukey serves as a licensed clinical social worker, currently serving as the national program manager for education and training for the caregiver support program. Ms. Dukey has over 24 years of experience at the VA and has held a variety of clinical, administrative, and leadership roles. She joined the National Caregiver Support Program in 2011. In her current role, she manages the national implementation of caregiver support program education, training, and support programs to ensure services are available and accessible for VA staff, caregivers, and stakeholders. She earned her Master's of Social Work degree from Wayne State University in 1998. At this time, I give you Ms. Nancy Dukey for today's presentation. Ms. Dukey? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It is wonderful to be here. I really do appreciate that introduction and the invitation to present to your group today. It, it really is a pleasure to have these strong collaborations and be able to share information across different organizations and more importantly, bring the information to our caregivers and veterans. So I'm going to pop off camera real quick so we don't have any connectivity issues and we'll get started with the presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So today I'm going to cover an introduction to the VA caregiver support program. Now, there are 2 unique programs under the caregiver support program or CSP. Um, as you know, if you're familiar with the government or the military, we have a lot of acronyms and you're going to hear those today. So we call the caregiver support program CSP. And the 2 unique programs we have are the program of general caregiver support services acronym PG CSS and the Program of Comprehensive Assistance for Family Caregivers, PCAFC. The two CSP programs are administered under the Veterans Health Administration. Next, please. Now, before we get started, um, I wanna talk a little about the evolution of the Caregiver Support Program. It's really important to understand where we started and where we're headed. So in 2008, the Caregiver Support Program was established, and this was really based on, in late 2007, as military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq progressed, the provision of services and supports to family caregivers of veterans seriously injured in these conflicts moved to the forefront. With these conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, new challenges present themselves for service members returning from combat with serious injuries that may have been fatal in previous conflicts. 
These service members required personal care services, which often provided were provided by family members and loved ones. In recognition of the significant challenge, in 2010, Congress enacted the Caregivers and Veterans Omnibus Health Services Act of 2010, or as we call it, Public Law 111-163. This required VA to establish specific supports for caregivers, for caregivers of veterans. The pr two programs that were established are the program of general caregiver support services and the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. In 2011, we officially began accepting applications for the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers or PCFC. It's been 12 years. Um, it was 12 years ago in May, May 11, 2011, that we launched. So it's been a great 12 years. During this time, we've, we've continued to evolve. In 2018, the Mission Act of 2018 expanded veteran eligibility for PCFC. And this was important because prior to this, um, or during this time, PCFC was for post 9-11 veterans. And the Mission Act really enacted this so that we could provide services for seriously injured veterans for all eras. Because of the Mission Act, it was designated that we would, um, the expansion would be implemented in two phases. So the first phase was in 2020, and this implemented the um, expansion of PCF eligibility. And these were veterans who were on, um, excuse me, who were seriously in the line of duty on or before May 7th, 1975. And then our second expansion occurred um, 2022, October 1st of 2022, and that was our final expansion that expanded to all service areas. Eras. So at this point in time, any veteran who is seriously injured or has a serious illness could be potentially eligible for PCFC. Next slide, please. Now, before we move into um, the information regarding the two different programs, I do want to highlight a couple of programs that I think are very, very helpful. They're great resources and tools if you're trying to discover information or want to learn more about caregiver support. The first is the Caregiver Support Program website. This website is outward facing. It can be um, accessed by anyone at www.caregiver.va.gov. And it's a, just a wonderful resource with a wealth of information. If you go onto the website, you're gonna find information regarding the Caregiver Support Program, information on how to reach out or contact your local caregiver support team at your local VA facility. It is based on a zip code based interactive locator. You put your zip code in and it will connect you um, to the information for your local VA has information about our caregiver support line, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, just a wealth of information resources for caregivers, tips and tools, resources, um, diagnosis, tip sheets, caregiver stories, um, our application link for PCFC is online there. So again, just a lot of information. If you really wanna take a little bit of time and go through that, I think it's very helpful. And again, anybody can access it, whether you're a veteran caregiver, a stakeholder, or even um, many people within our own program use that regularly. Another important thing that we've used the website for is as we've been going through expansion or, or as we've had changes in our program, we have used this as an important asset to make sure that we could put announcements out to the community about what is occurring. So when we were expanding, providing information about expansion, what that means for the veteran and caregivers, how do they apply? So again, just a lot of opportunities to learn a lot of information on our website. Next, please. Next is the caregiver support line. The caregiver support line is a toll free number for caregivers, family members, friends, veterans, and community partners to contact for information related to caregiving and available supports and services. They are open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern and Saturday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's um, the caregiver support line or CSL as we call it is staffed by VA professional staff. Again, they link callers to a local caregiver support team if there's questions or, or connections they, um, that caregiver would like to make or the veteran. They provide assistance and information about the VA and other community resources. And they also offer supportive counseling when needed. So the number is listed there. And, and this is a really important um, facet of our, one of our resources we offer. The caregiver support line really has been a, a great linkage for a lot of our 
veterans, caregivers, stakeholders, community partners. Um, especially during expansion, we had a significant amount of volume that came through the caregiver support line as people were asking questions, were trying to get connected and engaged. And again, it's just another great opportunity to connect and engage those who are interested in learning more about the program. Next, please. So we're going to start with talking about the program of general caregiver support services or PGCSS. Um, the mission of PGCSS is to serve caregivers with respect and service excellence through a wide range of support, education and tools that empower them to care for veterans and themselves. Next, please. So before we talk about PGCSS, we need to talk about what a general caregiver is, just really kind of level setting the definition. Uh, we know we have a tendency to have a lot of different terms, and I want to make sure that we're on the same page. So those caregivers who are enrolled in PGCSS, we refer to them as a general caregiver. And a general caregiver is a person who provides personal care services to a veteran who's enrolled in VA health care. So again, it's a caregiver who is providing for a veteran to enrolled in VA health care services. And that veteran has um, needs to have certain um, needs, assistance with one or more activities of daily living. Acti activities of daily living could include help with dressing, feeding, bathing, those type of things, or needing supervision or protection based on symptoms of res residuals of neurological care or other impairment or injury. Now, a general caregiver does not need to be a relative or live with a veteran to participate in the program. Next, please. So let's talk about enrollment into PGCSS. So for PGCSS, there's no formal application required. Um, if you wanna be enrolled in PGS, PGCSS or you wanna learn more about it, you would wanna reach out to your local facility caregiver support team, and they would assist you with the process. They would give you an overview of PGCSS, what the benefits are and what the requirements are to participate. One of the things that's important is that the veteran needs to agree to receive care from their caregiver as the caregiver will be listed in their healthcare record. And then the caregiver um, will have to complete an intake um, with the CSP team. And the veteran, again, will need to agree to receive care from the caregiver. And then they will be enrolled and begin to utilize the supports and services offered. Next, please. So we recognized it was important that across the VA that all caregivers have access to the same resources and services, no matter where the veterans receive care, and thus we establish four core elements um, that you can see here that are part of PGCSS. So we have education support, collaboration and partnerships, outreach, resources and referrals. Next, please. So training and support is offered through a variety of different opportunities to our caregivers. When we are offering education support, we are looking to be actively engaged with the caregiver to determine what's going to best fit their needs. And we have a lot of options for our caregivers based on what their preferences are, based on what their abilities to participate, and just really what their needs are. We have um, opportunities for in-face, um, face-to-face trainings, opportunities for um, group group support, peer support mentoring, um, web-based programs, just a variety of um, opportunities that caregivers can participate in. Um, some of the things that are on the next two slides are just some examples of some of the education support that are provided. And please note that these are not exhaustive. We are just highlighting a few of them. Um, first is the VA SAVE, which is a suicide prevention training that equips the caregivers um, to demonstrate care, support, and compassion when talking with their veterans who could be at risk for suicide. We know that suicide is a difficult conversation. It's difficult for clinicians at times, and it's definitely difficult for caregivers and others. So we wanna make sure that we're providing training to help them have those difficult conversations if necessary. Um, VA SAVE offers important information as well as simple steps and actions that caregivers can take. Building Better Caregivers um, is a wonderful resource. It's an online workshop. Um, it's a six-week workshop. It's self-paced lessons. It has a facilitator that guides it and group support from other caregivers. And it focuses on veterans with dementia, memory problems, PTSD, and a serious brain injury. So the content is really geared towards helping the caregiver build skills and become comfortable in different areas and understanding different diagnoses. 
Um, the great thing about building better caregivers, since it's web based, it's available 24 7, which is um, very convenient for many caregivers who cannot attend um, a, a scheduled event, but needs to do something on their own time when they're available. So it's a really nice um, opportunity for them. Next is our Annie Caregiver Text Program. Um, some of you may be familiar with Annie. Annie Text Program um, has been around the Office of Connected Care for veterans for quite a few years. And a couple of years ago, we were able to get in a collaboration with the Office of Connected Care to create Annie Text Care Program for caregivers. And so this program promotes self care for both veterans and their caregivers. And Annie's automated text messaging system that you can pick what topic you'd like to be enrolled in, and you will receive. Um, the caregiver, the veteran, you'll receive messages three to seven times a week um, that will help you manage stress and support self care with the focus on education, motivation, and activities that match stress. And, and this has really been a great program. We've, we've had a, a huge response with our text program. Um, I think since we rolled this out about two years ago, we have over 15,000 caregivers enrolled, and they really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity of getting these texts throughout the week for reminders or encouragement or the motivation or, or activities they can do to help them their day to day. We also have Reach VA Caregiver. Uh, Reach via caregiver program can be provided. It's a clinical intervention can be provided either individually or in a group or telephone setting, and it provides caregivers with problem solving skills, stress management techniques, and specific information on disease related concerns that are customized for each customer or for each caregiver. I should say next please. And, and again, just to highlight a few more of the resources, um, we have caregiver self resilience courses. Um, we have staff that provide these courses as part of a wellness series for caregivers and, and the resilience covers uh, three topics or one hour each on self discovery, self compassion and on the job self care for the caregiver. As part of that wellness series, they also offer self care. Chi Kong and mindfulness, and, and these have been really popular. I think our caregivers have really enjoyed these opportunities to really have the time to participate in self discovery, um, self compassion, mindfulness, just dif different opportunities they have enjoyed. Um, we have Caregivers First, and this is a caregiver skills group training program with the goal of connecting caregivers with each, with each other and resources to help them feel more competent, capable, and supported in the caregiving role. And again, you're probably hearing as I go along and talk about these different programs, that th really the aim of all these programs is to really help that caregiver feel competent and capable and support in their role to give them the education, the tools to help them in their journey with their care, in their caregiver journey with their veteran. Uh, we talked about reach a few moments ago, and then we have peer smart mentoring, and this is another great program. Peer smart mentoring um, links caregivers to a peer who has also experienced similar challenges and situations in order to provide additional support and guidance along the caregiving journey. So again, these are just a few of the programs that are offered that I want to highlight. Um, again, it really demonstrates a lot of opportunities for caregivers. And so when we're working with caregivers and trying to determine, you know, where the best fit would be, um, what would be most beneficial, what they would like to try, um, we have quite a menu of services to offer along with our community services and other national programs. Um, but more importantly, really want to tailor make it for, um, for that caregiver so that it, it, it's important for them and it resonates with them. Next, please. So collaboration and partnerships are really the cornerstone of so much of the work that we do. Caregivers are present throughout the VA in all of our communities, and it's critical that we collaborate and maintain strong partnerships to be sure that caregiver needs are met. Again, these collaborations, they happen at the local level, the national level. You know, we often say VA can do a lot, but we can't do it alone. And that's true. Um, this is why our trusted partnerships are so key in the work that we do. Just like today, being here with you guys on this call and all the work that Melissa and her group does is it's, it's so important for us to connect and share what we're doing. So the caregiver support program at each local site, they host an annual summit for VA and community providers to include caregiver specific topics. So we have a, an annual summit, um, the local site puts that on, and it really, the purpose of the summit is to understand the needs of caregivers in the local community, identify both gaps and available resources, bring together VA, local area nonprofits and community agency participants, 
And at the summit, these enti entities collaborate, share information, and network on behalf of caregivers. So again, it's that, that building, that coalition of building in the community for our caregivers. Um, also annually, we have um, local sites um, put on a caregiver support resource fair. And these are held at every VA medical center. And these fairs are really um, aimed at connecting caregivers with resources. Caregivers are invited to these fairs. Um, we have resources and programs and services that um, represent different organizations. And the fairs have information are attended by representatives from VA programs, local area nonprofits, and community agencies, and other services. Next, please. So outreach is really important. We want to make sure that our caregivers know we are here for them. So we work to make sure we are putting out communications to alert caregivers as to what is available to them. We don't want to wait for them to find us. We want to reach out and bring them in for support. So it's really important for us to be engaging and connecting with caregivers and those in the community. And there's quite a few ways that we are doing this. Um, our caregiver support staff, they serve as subject matter experts in our outreaching to various organizations, agencies, and stakeholders, including at events, both in person when able and virtual. And they do this year round through planned events as well as upon request. And again, there's other outreach that's occurring to the local hospitals, community agencies. Um, our local staff also provide consultations and guidance and subject matter um, expertise to community organizations regarding veterans and caregivers. And so it's real important that this outreach continues and that we continue to connect with our partners and with our caregivers and veterans so they're aware of what's available to them and they know where the support and resources are. Next, please. And then the last core piece is resource and referrals. And again, PGCSS, you know, our, our goal is to help caregivers get connected to the right services at the right time to support them. And, and this can vary. You know, we have learned that over our work with caregivers and veterans that it really is a continuum. What a caregiver may identify today as what's important to them or what they may be struggling with or what they may want to learn more about may change over time. So it's real important that we continue to evolve with our caregiver and veterans, make sure that we're offering, um, you know, just in time type of supports and resources, um, really listening and hearing to what the caregiver or veteran wants so we can can connect them correctly and properly and make sure that the value is there for that caregiver and veteran so they know that these services are here and that there's many opportunities for them to connect. Again, just want to reiterate, you know, we continue to have strong relationships with our VA and non-VA partners to help caregivers address any number of issues or needs that they may have. And again, back to the saying that we can't do it on our own, you know, there's there's so much out there. Um, there's so many community partners, there's um, internal partners. Um, we, we partner with whole health, mental health, um, geriatric extended cares within VA, our community organization and partners. So it's real important as we continue to connect and have these partnerships that we are familiar with what other resources and supports are not only coming from within the VA, but what's available through our other partners. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Okay. So we're going to move on to the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. And again, we call this PCFC. And as we move into this, I um, just want to remind people, if you're not familiar with PCFC, um, in the past, this program has been referred to as the stipend program. And um, we're really trying to move away from that because the program is more than that. There's a lot of benefits uh, for, for veterans and caregivers who are eligible for PCFC beyond the stipend, which, which itself is beneficial, but other resources that we can help support in. Um, also want to um, indicate that the program of comprehensive assistance for caregivers is a, a clinical program. And so as we walk through the next few steps, you'll see that there's a lot of requirements through regulations um, for participation in PCFC. So I'm going to walk through those. Um, please note it is a complex program and it's really hard sometimes to get um, the full understanding as we're walking through some slides, but please note that um, on our website and in other fact sheets and stuff, there's information that's available um, for you to follow along with um, after this call or within this presentation. So to participate in PCFC, um, um, a veteran has to meet seven criteria. 
So I'm just going to highlight a few of those. So for a veteran service member, they have to be undergoing a medical discharge. They must have a serious injury incurred or aggravated in the line of duty. And we define a serious injury as a 70% service connected rating. And this can be a single or combined rating, and it can include a presumptive rating. The veteran must need in-person personal care services for a minimum of six continuous months based on one of the following. An inability to perform an activity of daily living, and again, that could be bathing, dressing, feeding. A need for supervision or protection based on symptoms of residuals of neurological or other impairment or injury. And, and sometimes people say, well, what's safety and supervision? And so that, that's really related to neurological, cognitive, or, or mental health needs that may um, require a veteran to require um, extra assistance for safety and maybe supervision. A need for regular or extensive instruction or supervision with without the ability the, the veteran would not be able to function daily life would be seriously impaired. So again, a need for regular or extensive instruction or supervision without which the ability of the veteran to function in daily life would be seriously impaired. So these are the, the primary ones and these are really important. So again, the veteran and service member must be undergoing a medical discharge. They must have a serious injury incurred or aggravated in the line of duty. They must have at least a 70% service connected rating and that can be a single or combined rating. And then they must meet the in-person personal care needs for a minimum of six months. Next, please. So PCFC services um, offers a variety of things. We always say the PCFC program is enhanced services. All the services are um, available for someone who's enrolled in PGCSS are available under PCFC, along with the monthly stipend if approved, access to healthcare through CHAMP VA if eligible and the caregiver does not have health insurance, and then financial planning and legal resources for pri primary family caregivers. And this is a new benefit. Um, we were working a contract for a while to get this awarded to a vendor. Um, I'm happy to share that legal, live legal and financial planning services have become available to primary family caregivers as of April 24th of 2023. So if a primary family caregiver is seeking these services, they can con contact their local CSP team for assistance. And we are still working through a web-based service such as live webinars and trainings. Those are still under development and will be coming soon. So again, the PCFC services um, really is comprehensive. It's really an, an enhanced services for our severely injured or ill um, veterans and caregivers who are caring for them. Next, please. So within PCFC, uh, reassessments are part of the program. It's part of the clinical requirements. Um, Currently, there is a suspension on certain discharges, reductions, and reassessments in PCFC, which took place on June 9, 2022. VA um, has determined that annual reassessments, so annual reassessments were required for those who are participating in PCFC, that annual reassessments completed within PCFC participants are unnecessary for all veterans and their family caregivers in PCFC at this time. And VA is now reviewing and examining eligibility and stipend level criteria. So during this time when things are being reviewed and examined, um, facility CSP staff will continue to initiate a reassessment based on a request for a reassessment made by a veteran or a family caregiver. For example, um, we may have a PCFC participant and their caregiver may request for a reassessment because that veteran's care needs may have changes. Maybe they're requiring more care at this point and they would like them reassessed. And so that could, um, a reassessment could occur based on that. Um, any reassessment that would occur would not at this point impact the veteran negatively. There would be no decrease um, in their stipend amount and they would not be discharged from the program at this time if they, if it was determined that there was a change in their status. But if there was an increase in their personal care level needs, they could get an increase in their benefit. Again, no reduction in stipend level or discharge based on eligibility or stipend level. Um, will occur based on such a reassessment. 
until further BHA decisions are made about the processes. And review and appeal options for PCFC um, remain the same and can be found on the CSP website. So again, just a little information because as we talk about those who are eligible and participate in PS PCFC as part of the requirements, um, there's an application process, there's an assessment process, and then within your participation in PCFC, the, um, their wellness contacts, and then there's annual reassessments. And as I just shared with you, there has been some shift in the reassessments currently right now in certain discharges as why, while VHA is reexamining certain criteria. Next, please. And again, I do want to say, I know this is a lot of information and a lot of details. It's a very complex program. And um, again, we will make sure that there's, um, you'll have the PowerPoint available to look at. And again, I just want to just draw people to our website. There's a lot of information there that could be really helpful, including fact sheets about some of the things we were talking about. So, in addition, the Department of Veterans Affairs posted an interim final rule to the Federal Register on 9-21-22. And this extends a program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers eligibility for certain veterans and their family caregivers through September 30th, 2025. So after expansion, the original intent was that reassessments would start occurring and veterans and caregivers who'd been in the program prior to expansion, they would have a reassessment based on the new criteria and eligibility um, that came with expansion. So this new rule, this interim rule, um, will extend program eligibility for legacy participants, legacy applicants, and their family caregivers by three years. And that's at September 30th, 2025 date. And just, just to help with um, some of the definitions here, a legacy participant is a veteran or service member who is participating in PCFC as of September 30th, 2020. So our first expansion occurred October 1st, 2020. So these are our veterans who are participating in PCFC prior to the expansion. And then our legacy applicants, um, our veterans or service members who applied for P PCFC before October 1st, 2020, but were accepted into the program on or after October 1st, 2020. So again, this is related to when we had our expansion in 2020. And so we have two groups of, of veterans, those who were in the program prior to expansion, and then those who were approved um, right there during expansion. And so there's special provisions for them at this time in terms of extended eligibility until uh, 2025. Next, please. Okay. So let's talk about the application process um, and how it works for PCFC. So how does the veteran and caregiver initiate the PCFC application process? Well, there's a variety of options. So if a veteran and a caregiver, if they're interested in PCFC, if they meet those, um, you know, requirements that we talked about earlier, they're seriously injured or have a serious illness due to um, in, aggravation or incurred during the line of duty. Um, and the other things that we mentioned earlier, um, if they feel like they may be um, eligible for the program, um, they can complete the application online um, and they can do it online through the um, website at www.caregiver.va.gov. For most, this is the fastest and easiest route. Um, they can also access and download the application. The application is called the 1010CG. It's one of our VA forms. And they can download that and they can fill it out and they can either mail it or walk the application to a local caregiver support team. They also can mail the form and any supporting documents to the Program of Comprehensive Assistance for Family Caregivers at the Health Eligibility Center, which is Atlanta, Georgia. And the addresses are listed on the slide. And then the veteran caregivers can also contact their local caregiver support team for assistance. And again, the caregiver support team link is in the website and it will link you to your local um, caregiver support team based on your zip code. So as you can see, there's a variety of ways that caregivers and veterans um, may come in and apply for the program or do it online or mail it in. So lots of options are available to really kind of meet the, the needs of different um, veterans and caregivers. Next, please. So here's a, a really lovely um, <laughs> flow chart of our application. I love it. I think it's colorful. I think it's easy to read. Um, it may be hard to see on the screen, um, but this really kind of 
outlines what to expect when the veteran and caregiver applies for PCFC. Um, first of all, we, we do like to make sure that when we receive an application, our goal is to process the application in full within 90 days. That is one of our metrics. And, and I'm happy to say that there's been a lot of work over the past couple of years to really meet that 90 day um, timeline and we are doing really well with that. Um, I think we were at like 90, 90 something percent of our applications are now processed within 90 days. So, once an application is received by a caregiver support team, a preliminary review is performed. Following that review, a veteran assessment, a veteran functional assessment, and a caregiver assessment is scheduled and completed by the caregiver support team at the facility. And again, I, I just want to reinforce that, you know, these assessments are part of, of the application process and they're required and it's important that we complete these because this is a clinical program. So we really want to have full assessments on our veterans to really understand what their care needs are and to really understand um, how we can best help support them and their caregiver. Once these assessments are completed, the caregiver support team collaborates with the veterans primary provider for input about the veterans needs. So, again, the application process is not done in a silo. We want to make sure that we're gathering information from the veteran, the caregiver. We're doing the assessments and then we're gathering information um, from the veterans primary care team. Also, once the complete assessments, um, the complete assessments are then reviewed by the VISN Centralized Eligibility and Appeals Team. We call these teams SEAT, again, another one of our acronyms, and they determine initial eligibility. Now, our seat teams are located at the VISN level, which stands for Veterans Integrated Service Network. If a seat determines initial eligibility is met, the caregiver is referred to caregiver training. So caregiver training is our core curriculum where caregivers will um, complete um, this core curriculum. And once that's complete, an initial home care assessment will take place and seat verifies caregiver training completion the result of the home care assessment, and then they make the final eligibility determination and stipend level. So, so this is really important. Um, again, as we talk about where we were and where we are now, there's been a lot of evolution in terms of how decisions and determinations are being made. Our goal over the past couple years has really been to make sure that there's consistency in determinations. When the program first rolled out, we had individual providers who were making determinations. Um, we had, um, at one point, we had um, teams that were making them. So we have come to, um, we have really evolved to a really formalized um, seat team that is reviewing and making these determinations. And our seat teams are really inter- and multidisciplinary staff. Um, they include a variety of different disciplines, nurses, psychology, social work, physicians, PAs, um, a lot of individuals who are reviewing the information. And, and our goal is to have consistency in our determination so that determinations that are occurring maybe in um, Ann Arbor VA will be very consistent with um, the same situation if um, it was being determined in St. Louis. So again, that's really our goal. And these seat teams really have worked really, really hard to make sure that they understand the processes and, and they're getting those full assessments to make the best decisions for that veteran and caregiver. So once all this takes place, the, um, once that's been completed, the veteran and each family caregiver applicant will receive a decision notice regarding their eligibility determination. Um, I do wanna note that before, during, and after the application process for PCFC, a veteran and their caregiver can be referred to the Program of General Caregiver Support Services, or PGCSN, PGCSS, and they can be receiving those services during the application process. Also, if at any time a veteran or caregiver disagrees with any portion of the decision regarding their application, they can file for review or appeal. And we'll discuss this um, in a few moments. So again, here's our flow chart. It really kind of walks through the steps and um, different points and determines that occur during the application process and what that looks like for a veteran and caregiver. And, and this is important because as we continue to talk to our veteran and caregivers, it's important for them to understand the process, to be prepared, um, and, and to know the timelines, it's really helpful for them to stay um, in the know. And I think it creates better outcomes for everyone. And just like anybody else, we'd like to know what's going on. We all wanna be informed. And so I think this is a really nice way to help our veterans and caregivers understand the process. Next, please. 
So review, review and appeal options for PCFC. So sometimes we may have a veteran or a caregiver that may disagree with a decision or determination. And if they disagree, whether in whole or in part, the Department of VA, um, with the Department of VA decision under PCFC, there are options for them to appeal or to request a Veterans Health Administration review of the decision. The options depend on the date the VA issued the PCFCA decision. So there's um, a couple different options that are available to veterans and caregivers for appeal. So previously, veterans and caregivers could only appeal a determination or a PCFC decision through the VHA, Veterans Health Administration Clinical Review Process. And this is formally known as the VHA Clinical Appeals Process, or usually typically handled at local VAs. And then veterans and caregivers now have additional options available to appeal or request a VHA review of the decision. So there's different levels of, of appeals that veterans can um, choose based on uh, where they would like to move their request forward. For information and to initiate the veterans um, VHA clinical appeal review process, the veteran and caregiver needs to contact the patient advocate at their local VA medical facility. And then again, you know, for veterans or anyone who's looking um, to contact a local VA medical center, they can use the VA locator at your local um, medical center. So again, those are just the options that are available for review and appeals. Um, again, as we continue to evolve in our program, our review and appeal options have been evolving too. Want to make sure there's options for our veteran and caregivers to choose from based on what's best for what they want to move forward. Okay, next please. Okay, so just a, a little bit more information about review and appeal options. So we have, um, if a veteran or caregiver disagrees with the PCFC decision issue before February 19th, 2019, so if a veteran or caregiver were participating in PCFC and they um, had an appeal that was issued before or a decision before February 19th, 2019, they can now appeal to the board using the legacy appeals process. So there's another process that's available for those who would like to make an appeal from that date period. Now, if the veteran and caregiver disagree with a PCFC decision issued on or after February 19th, 2019, they can utilize one of the following three options, a supplemental claim, higher level review, or an appeal to the board. A higher level review is a review by an experienced decision maker within the caregiver support program who was not involved in the prior decision. So we're talking about what are the supplemental claims or a higher level review. A supplemental claim is a request for VA to consider new and relevant ev evidence that was not of record when VA made its um, decision prior. And then the appeal to the board is a request for the veterans law judge, VLJ, to review a decision by VHA. So as you can see, there's there's different levels of appeal here that veterans and caregivers can now um, decide on. Um, again, as a reminder, um, the VHA clinical review, probably known as the VHA clinical appeal process, is also still available for decisions made on any date. However, a VHA clinical review is not available if the veteran or caregiver has filed an appeal to the board. So again, we can't have two review or two appeal processes going on once. So if someone or veteran or caregiver decides to um, go the route of a VHA clinical review and they have that in process, they cannot file an appeal to the board. They have to um, complete whatever a, a appeal process is in place before they move forward. Okay. I'm going to stop and take a breath there because I know it's a lot of information and we're at the very, very, very end of our presentation. Um, so I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, again, I really encourage everyone to please visit our website. Um, we often add updates and new information on a regular basis. And again, a lot of the information I've shared today will be available on the website and we do have fact sheets and other information. I think that's very helpful. You are welcome to share this information with others. You can guide them to the website. And again, for anyone who has specific questions or um, has other inquiries and would like to speak with someone regarding, um, they can reach out to our local um, caregiver support teams. Every VA facility, local VA medical facility has a caregiver support team. And so any facility um, will have that team that you can talk to or they can offer um, services to veteran and caregivers who are looking for caregiver support. 
Also, we have the caregiver support line. We talked about that earlier. Um, that's a number you can call with our uh, professional staff and they can help connect. They can give um, you know, recommendations and resources and connections for those who call. And again, that's not just for caregivers and veterans, it's for others, for community um, stakeholders, people who are interested in learning more. Um, maybe you heard something today during this presentation that struck you, maybe about a week from now, you'll say, what, you know, what did Ms. Dupke say about, you know, um, appeals? I think I need more information. I can't find the website or, you know, I'd like to talk that through. I mean, the CSL could be a good linkage for you too. Okay, and then you just, and just real quickly, just last slide is about uh, additional review and appeal options. And so I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to move it back to true. All right, great, great. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that wealth of information on the PCAFC and the PGCSS program under the caregiver program. It was wonderful. Absolutely. So informative and um, uh, great to have. We're now gonna address any questions uh, in the Q&A box to the right of your screen here. I will read the questions out loud and Ms. Dukey or Ms. Como will provide a response. If we are unable to get around to your questions today, we do have your email address. We will take down your question and get the question to them for them to provide a response directly back to you. So let's get started. Uh, we do have a few questions in the Q&A box here, Ms. Uh, Dupi. And the first question, uh, there are comments as well. Uh, but the first question I have is from G. Dukas. And the question is, how does a veteran work with the patient advocate for an appeal when the patient advocate does not see the letter or why it was denied, but only a statement in their record stating it was denied without any backup data. So this veteran is working with the patient advocate uh, for an appeal, right? And mm -hmm. um, they don't have any backup information. So that's a kind of tricky question. Nope, it's, it's a good question. Thank you, Mr. Dugas. So our, our patient advocates work at the local sites and they help facilitate the process. And so when someone files an appeal at the local VA, whether it's caregiver support or any other clinical appeal with, at that facility, that patient advocate, they help facilitate that process. They get the information. Um, there is a system called PATS that they upload the information in. And then those who are reviewing the appeal, they're the ones that get the information. Um, they will have access to the chart. They will have the information that was sub submitted by the veteran through the patient advocate through the portal and any other um, supporting information that's been provided to make um, a determination on that appeal based on the information they have. And then at that point, once decisions are made, the patient advocate does help support, um, you know, documenting um, what the outcome of um, the appeal may have been in their system and then the caregiver support team um, works along with their team to make sure that that caregiver and veteran are notified of that outcome. So again, the patient, yeah, the patient advocate, they're not making the determination right. about the appeal themselves. They're just facilitating the process. But that, that's a really right. good question because there's lots of steps and it gets confusing very easily. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of veterans, veterans do go to the patient advocate um, to help them sort out some of the mm -hmm. confusion. So um, the second question is also coming from um, G. Dukas, and the question is, what or where does it describe what is the VHA clinical review process? So the VHA, so there, there's lots of information. Um, it was posted on our website at one point. Um, I'd have to check and see if it's still there because we rotate information and we're adding new information. Um, it is available. Um, our, there, they are directives that are available at every um, VA site. So if someone wants to ask for it, they would be able to um, get access to them. They're also typically available if you go and Google off, you can find them under the VA. Um, but if, there, if you're looking specifically for it, your local um, caregiver support team could help get a copy of that if you want to take a look at that or if you want to speak with them about the details of it. Um, we do have an appeals, a review and appeals team, a formal team that's now in place. They've been building for quite a while to help support um, 
review and appeals. And again, that comes back to, you know, ensuring we have strong clinicians and, and um, consistent practices in place to make sure that we're making good decisions for the veteran and caregiver. So there's different options as I indicated in the slide deck, but um, I, I would encourage if you had specific questions to reach out to your local caregiver support team um, or reach out to the caregiver support line. Um, they have information on the appeals process along with what's on the website. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, those are all the questions that we have. We have about three comments also that you can um, look at when you get a chance uh, from uh, Mr. Dukas and um, Dr. Novus. Um, if you need to reach out to the presenters, uh, please see their point of contact information on the screen here, as you can see. Uh, you can also reach out to our team for inf any information. Our point of contact information will also be on the screen. At this time, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Mr. Washington for closing remarks. Thank you. Hey, look, Nancy, that was great information. We really appreciate it. Uh, very informative. So thank you again for taking time. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you have a safe and wonderful weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. Again, I want to ask that you take time to reflect uh, on those service members who gave their life for our country. Thank you all and be blessed. If you registered for this event, we will, this webinar today, we will provide you with today's presentation. The presentation will be provided also on our website at a later date. Please subscribe to our website and Facebook page for future webinars and information. We thank you so much for joining us today. This adjourns today's webinar. Thank you and happy Memorial Day uh, holiday. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.